Good rainy morning. Good rainy Monday morning of the 20th. Now let me see if I get this right. The 20th week in ordinary times. It's actually a Wednesday <laughs> weeks earlier. We have one dickens of a thunderstorm here. I actually shook the house. <laughs> one, even Lily picked her head up and said, all right, what's going on? Anyway, it's the, uh, it's the 20th week. So I decided to get ahead on these videos and just uh, reflect, just the soft reflection uh, on the text. I'm more focused on the Gospels. I'll tell you why, because the first readings have been from the Old Testament, eggs, and I, uh, I, I simply don't under, I don't know them well enough to be able to talk about them, honestly. But the Gospels seem to be clearer for me, I guess, and I'm able to at least reflect out loud a bit of it, a bit of it, uh, a bit of it, a bit of it. Here's a good one, okay? This in Matthew, again, it's chapter 19. He said, the young man approached Jesus and said, teacher, what good must I do to gain eternal life? He answered him, why do you ask me about what the good? There's only one who is good. Now, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He asked him, which ones? Jesus replied, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall and you shall love your neighbors yourself. The young man said to him, All of these I have observed. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the man, when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. It's an interesting, it's a great text. See, he went away, he had many possessions. It was, you see, the, the commandments, except for the last two, are negative. I would say, you know, they're, they're fundamental to human experience and human civility. You can't have a society without them. You can't have a society in which you have murder and of uh, deliberate destroyed marriages where you, no property is safe, okay? Where you lie in courts where false falsehood is normal, see? But then he says, honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbors yourself. Those are the positive, honor and love. Okay? But he says, yeah, I do all these things. One more, and, uh, and our Lord says to me, oh, you want to be perfect? Then you have to follow me, see? You sell what you have. He said, sell what you have and give to the poor. Come, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Follow me. Okay. And the guy had a lot of stuff, and he chose not to follow Christ. You know what I want to say this? You know, I get it. If I sound, I don't want to sound in any way blasphemous or anything like that. But some, it, it, it's very interesting what you value, what, what you think is valuable, you see. I remember when I uh, felt called to religious life, not the priesthood, but religious life, okay, with the passionists, see? The hardest thing to give up in, in terms of possessions uh, was my shotgun, my, my, my shotgun, and my, my surf casting rods. It, it depends on what you value, you see? And I was 17 years old, okay? See? But I did give them up. And, and I got a hundredfold in return, see? But I wasn't thinking the hundredfold at the time. I was just thinking, okay. But isn't it funny how a 17-year-old, what you value? It could be a car. It could be a motorcycle. It could be anything. But, you know, I think of an old, as an older person, okay, now an old goat, actually, whatever I am. When I think of what is those possessions that hold me back, okay, from, from the freedom of tomorrow, very often, it isn't a physical thing. It can be, and I can easily see it. But often, it's the values, and in some ways, the structural values, the, the good old days, the things we did, or the things, I think, in the church, um, the pious past. Now, I'm not tempted too strongly in that direction, but it could be. You see, sometimes it's our conventional way of thinking that keeps us from the adventure of new ideas, and new ideas and new aspirations. You see, that's trickier. 
That's a very, very tricky possession. It's a comfort with the past and a fear of the adventure of the future. If you wanted to be comfortable, you would never get married. Not with a clear head, because you are you're going into a very unknown future that is extremely demanding and creative, but it's creatively demanding. If you knew all that you were going to have to, in a sense, experience, live with, and deal with, you might not. If you want the comfort of certitude, you have to stick with the past. The only thing that is certain is what happened, not what is happening or what will happen. And sometimes in life we are afraid of the future and we choose only the past. We choose the ways of the past. And that's fatal. That's fatal. It's not a lack of perfection, detachment necessary for perfection. It's attachment in opposition to life itself. If you had a, when I left home, you know, 60, what was it, 64 years ago, in, September, in August, two weeks from now, will be 64 years that I left home. I fully expected to live a fully monastic life the rest of my life, and it actually it's what drew me into the outfit. It was purely, it's not its preaching mission as though I'm a preacher, okay? It was monasticism in its full sense. You had to know the outfit 50, 60 years ago, how, how monastically structured it was, and that's what drew me. I loved the austerity and the beauty of the monasticism. And the, the class that was, when I joined the outfit, the, the aesthetics of the music, uh, the Gregorian chant, we were well trained. I've never heard anything that could equal it, other than the other monasteries. I said the Trappists were fabulous at it. When you hear Gregorian chant really sung correctly, it's beyond prayerful. <laughs> and we were good at it. And I was a music, because I was an old trumpet player, I was one of the students who was a music director. And my specialty, my specialty was Gregorian. It was Gregorian, I love Gregorian chant. And then what came along was the liturgical changes. And once they got rid of Latin, brought in the vernacular, rightfully so, so went the art. That particular art, the Gregorian chant really disappeared. It disappeared overnight. And so there's an attachment to hold on to Gregorian chant would be in some senses to resist the movement of the, of the liturgical movements of its time. It, not necessarily, but it could be. And not to appreciate the genius of what followed. I think of my colleague, John Foley, and the St. Louis Jesuits who produced magnificent hymns. They'll be singing those hymns a thousand years, hundreds of years from now. Okay? But <laughs> Gregorian chant, because it was Latin, and the church sought vernacular to move into the vernacular, global Christianity, a global Christianity, as a part, part as opposed to a, a Eurocentric, therefore Latin Christianity. Mm -hmm. Then Latin becomes an art form, but not the voice. It's not the language of the church anymore. And to want to go back to it is to want to go backwards to bring it forward as an aesthetic element within liturgy, only as an aesthetic element, not as a necessary element, but as, as a work of art, as any other work, as the same as singing in Palestrina or some of the other great composers, see? As an art form. Yeah. The danger is always to look backwards, not in admiration and gratitude, but in need. The need to go backwards, you can't. That's the possession that is inimical to the future. That's inimical to, to perfection. Perfection is to be Christ-like in the adventure. But the apostles were called. They didn't know what they were getting into. But they didn't ask either. They made mistakes and fumbled along the way, but they followed Christ. And Christ always calls us into tomorrow, not backwards. And that's the truth. That is the truth about life itself. You want to live in the past, then you have to die. You're going to die. That's the truth. You're certainly going to dry, die intellectually and morally. You have to live in the future with its adventure and its difficulties, but it's adventure of grace. Grace calls us into the adventure of tomorrow to follow Christ 
is to follow him into tomorrow by the lives we providentially live.